Good evening and welcome. I'm Mark Mercer. I'm the chair of the philosophy department here at St. Mary's. I wanted to remind you, if you uh, or, or inform you if you don't know, that uh, the Atlantic Region Philosophers Association uh, begins its meetings tomorrow here at St. Mary's. And our keynote uh, speaker is uh, Stephen Stitch, uh, tonight's uh, Roland Marshall um, lecturer. 7.30 tomorrow if you uh, want to hear Dr. S uh, Dr. Stitch again, just down the hall. Now, Roland Marshall is a retired member of the St. Mary's Philosophy Department. Roland works mainly on Hegel and German philosophy, uh, also on aesthetics. Roland is also a poet and a painter, and he sometimes um, brings his paintings and his poetry together, painting illustrating the poems or the poems commenting interpreting the paintings. I want to uh, acknowledge Roland. He's in the audience tonight. Yesterday was Roland's 90th birthday. The annual lecture in public philosophy, named for Roland, has been a tradition at St. Mary's for over 15 years now. I'd like to thank Roland for his inspiration and his generosity and for bringing into being what now is an eagerly anticipated intellectual event in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and even further. The lecture series came into being in the early 2000s when Roland noticed that many philosophers had much of interest and importance to say to people generally about ethics, certainly, but also about science, religion, the meaning of life, the nature and possibility of inquiry and understanding, all topics that everyone thinks about, at least now and then, both inside and outside the university. But public discussion of these matters, it occurred to Roland, was rarely philosophical, neither in tone nor in substance. There appeared to be two reasons for this. One, philosophers were writing mainly only for each other in essays and books that only other philosophers would dare to read. <laughs> the second reason is that there were too few venues open to philosophers who would like to reach a wider audience. The lecture series in public philosophy was Roland's solution to both of these problems. By creating a venue for philosophers to address the public on matters of general interest, philosophers would be encouraged to find voices in which they could speak to the public and enter into public discussions. Roland's idea has been a terrific success. This year's Marshall Lecture in Public Philosophy is co-sponsored by the Department of Philosophy at St. Mary's and the Canadian Center for Ethics and Public Affairs, CICEPA. Scott Edgar and Todd Calder, this year's and last year's chair of the Marshall Lecture Committee, and Chris Stova at CICEPA are to be thanked for their hard work. Support for this year's lecture has come from the Roland Marshall Public Philosophy Lecture Fund, from the Office of the Vice President, Academic and Research, thank you, Malcolm Butler, from the Office of the President, thank you, Robert Summerby Murray, and from the Office of the Dean of Arts, thank you, Margaret MacDonald. Chris at SACEPA would like me to remind you to fill in the forms in front of you before you leave tonight. Having your opinions will help to ensure successful events in the future. Our agenda tonight looks like this. I'm about to introduce Todd Calder. Todd will introduce Stephen Stitch. Dr. Stitch will speak, then we'll have a question and answer session. Todd will moderate. Uh, then we'll go into the foyer for a cheese reception and informal discussion. Uh, now, let me present to you Todd Calder, a member of the philosophy department at St. Mary's University and a member of the Roland Marshall Committee. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce uh, this year's Marshall Lecture uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Stitch. Um, Dr. Stitch is uh, professor of philosophy and cognitive science at Rutgers University and an honorary professor in philosophy at the University of Shetland. Dr. Stitch has been doing uh, cutting edge research at the intersection of philosophy and psychology uh, for many years now. In fact, I looked at his um, CV recently and I noticed that with so many years it might be indiscreet to even say how many years that's been. Um, he, uh, he has not only had an illustrious career himself but also mentored 
many of the top minds working in moral uh, psychology and the philosophy of uh, psychology, generally speaking, and uh, has published uh, six books, over 160 articles, and has received academic awards, including being inducted into the American, um, what is it called, the American Academy of Arts and, and Sciences. So it's with great uh, pleasure uh, that I uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Stitch to you now. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, I want to make two confessions before I start. Confession number one is I have a failing that has gotten worse as I get older. Uh, and it is an obsession with preparing too much material. So my attempt tonight is going to be to go through about 130 PowerPoint slides with you. <laughs> but if you all leave before I get through, I'll take the message that uh, I'm presenting too much. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, I wanted to say uh, in advance is that the real theme uh, that I'm going to be talking about tonight is a revolution in a part of philosophy uh, that um, until about roughly 20 or 25 years ago, philosophers and psychologists were both interested in ethics, but they went their separate ways. And about 20 years ago, uh, there began to be a real synthesis between these two areas. And that now has grown enormously, uh, uh, the fruits of some of that I'll be talking about tonight. But that's the real theme uh, that, for the first time, basically in the history of Western thought, uh, philosophers and psychologists are collaborating productively. All right. So uh, my uh, title question, can, philosopher, uh, can psychologists contribute anything to uh, tell us anything about morality? You might think, hey, the answer to that is obvious. Why bother to ask? After all, if a court wants to know whether a defendant is competent to stand trial or whether an old person suffering from dementia is competent to make her own financial decisions, of course, input from psychologists uh, is relevant. And I don't think anybody has ever denied that, uh, which isn't to say, of course, that the psychologists are the people who should make these decisions, but that they have crucially relevant information. So that's not controversial and uh, never has been. Uh, but uh, issues like these, questions like uh, should psychologists consult about uh, whether a person is competent to stand trial and other issues of that sort, are drawn from the part of philosophical ethics called normative ethics. But there's another large part of moral philosophy, often called meta-ethics or sometimes critical ethics, that asks much more theoretical questions about the nature of morality itself. And the question I want to address is whether psychologists can tell us anything about the questions that are of interest in meta-ethics. Not to keep you in suspense, the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, that <clears throat> what's been happening over the last 20 or so years uh, is we have been getting first a trickle and by now a flood of genuinely interdisciplinary cooperation and dialogue and motion forward. All right, well, to make the case, I'm going to look at three meta-ethical issues. The first one asks, are there right and wrong, correct and incorrect answers to moral questions? Are some moral claims just true and others false? Or aren't moral claims truth apt at all, as philosophers sometimes say? The second question I'm going to look at is whether human beings are capable of genuine altruism or whether deep down our fundamental nature is egoistic. And the third uh, is, are there any moral principles that are really innate? So those are the three topics. Uh, and um, if we get through all 120 or 130 slides, uh, we'll get to the end of it. 
So let's start with the first one. Moral realism, that's a bit of jargon. Uh, it's not the best term in the world, but it's the one philosophers use. That's just the thesis in metaethics uh, that says moral claims are either true or false. Uh, so uh, moral realism says in this respect, moral claims are uh, on all fours with claims in science or mathematics or history. Moral anti-realism, basically the denial of moral realism, uh, says that moral claims aren't either true or false. They're doing something else, okay? Well, ever since antiquity, some philosophers have thought that the phenomenon of moral disagreement, particularly persistent moral disagreement, was relevant to uh, <clears throat> assessing moral realism. Now, of course, some moral disagreements can be easily explained without posing any challenge or threat to moral realism. A great deal of moral disagreement arises over disagreement about non-factual matters. So think about uh, a debate that you can hear south of the border all too often, I'm afraid, uh, between uh, people who are disagreeing with uh, about uh, what we should do, moral claims, normative claims, what should we do about climate change. Uh, uh, and uh, those people may well have different factual beliefs about the role of humans in climate change or the uh, ability of humans to affect climate change. Uh, but if those moral, dis if those factual disagreements were to disappear, uh, then in many cases at least the moral disagreement would disappear as well. So there's no challenge to moral realism there. Similarly, uh, some moral disagreements arise because uh, of failures of rationality on one party or both. I often feel that the people who disagree with me morally, no, that's, uh, 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 but uh, obviously if one or both parties to the discussion is just irrational, this poses no threat to moral realism, uh, just as uh, a disagreement between two people about a mathematical fact wouldn't pose any challenge to mathematical realism, the idea that there's truth and falsehood in mathematics, uh, if one of the people was being irrational. Okay? And a third uh, thing to point out is that some moral disagreements obviously result from self-interest. And this, too, perhaps poses no threat to moral realism. But now, suppose that disagreement were to persist under what I'll call ideal conditions. What do I mean by that? Well, those are conditions where there's no factual disagreement, and there's no irrationality, and there's no influence of self-interest. So suppose that would happen. I'll call that kind of disagreement fundamental disagreement. Well, a number of philosophers uh, on both sides of this debate uh, have urged that maybe the best explanation for fundamental disagreement is that there's no right answer that people can agree on. Okay? Uh, so the idea is if people have fundamental moral disagreements, why could that be? Well, they're looking for the true answer and there's no truth to be found. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> Nick Sturgeon, uh, who is an extremely well-known philosopher and a moral realist, uh, stated, so he's on the side of the moral real. He thinks there's truth and falsity in this area. Um, uh, but he stated the problem in a way that I think is worth the time to go through uh, a little bit slowly. So here's what Sturgeon says. He says, look, persistent moral disagreement provides an argument for moral skepticism. Because one obviously possible explanation of our, for our difficulty in settling moral disagreements is that they're really unsettleable. If they're really unsettleable, then it's not a surprise we can't settle them, right? Uh, there's no way of justifying one rather than another competing view. And he goes on to say, a possible further explanation for the unsettleability of moral disagreements uh, is moral nihilism the view that on these issues there just is no fact of the matter. And the impossibility of discovering and establishing moral truths is due to there not being any. 
So there we have, uh, I think, a very eloquent, clear statement of the way persistent moral disagreement might lead you to be a moral anti-realist. Well, at this point, the discussion of this deep philosophical question uh, that, as I said, has loomed large in the philosophical debates ever since antiquity, uh, divides into two separate parts. The first part is philosophical. The issue at hand is whether fundamental moral disagreement, which remember, as I'm using it, a sort of technical term means moral disagreement under those idealized circumstances which isn't driven by factual disagreement or irrationality or personal interest, uh, whether uh, moral disagreement under idealized circumstances would in fact be best explained by moral anti-realism. So there's a really interesting philosophical debate to be had there, but that's not the debate I want to talk about. The second part of the question is an empirical, a scientific, a factual question. It asks whether it really is the case that some important moral disagreements are fundamental and that they persist under the idealized circumstances that can't be explained by factual disagreement or rationality or personal interest. Right? So as I said, I'm not going to pursue the philosophical part of the discussion this evening. Uh, rather, what I'm going to do is talk about three research programs in psychology that I believe support the contention that some, and I do want to stress some, I should have underlined it in red or something, some uh, important moral disagreements are fundamental. I also think, but I'm not going to be talking about that tonight, that some aren't. Okay, so let me try to convince you that some moral disagreements are fundamental. Really important work in this area uh, derives from uh, the work of uh, this guy who I must say is uh, one of my oldest and closest uh, intellectual friends and colleagues, uh, Richard Nisbet, who is uh, one of the world's leading social psychologists and has done important work in many areas, including uh, his work on the cultures of honor. Uh, and you can read about that in this book, among others. Really good read, by the way, and it's about 120 pages. You can read it in a, uh, a long afternoon. So what's the culture of honor? Well, uh, let me again read you what Nisbet tells you about cultures of honor. He says, a key aspect of a culture of honor is the importance placed on insult and the, necessary, the necessity to respond to it. An insult implies that the target is weak enough to be bullied. Since a reputation for strength is of, ess of the essence of a culture of honor, uh, an individual who insults someone must be forced to retract. If the instigator refuses, he must be punished with violence or even death. Now, cultures of honor are a phenomenon that have been studied by anthropologists and social psychologists in many places around the world. They tend to arise, not surprisingly, uh, in situations where resources are liable to theft and where the state's coercive apparatus uh, can't be relied on to punish theft. One of these conditions uh, often occurs in relatively remote areas, maybe some parts of Nova Scotia, hmm, uh, where herding is the main viable form of agriculture. Uh, and herding, as opposed to growing wheat or growing apples, uh, is particularly liable to theft. Why? Well, uh, because <clears throat> If you're a herder, uh, your possessions are portable, whereas if you're a wheat farmer, it's kind of hard to steal your wheat crop, okay? Uh, there is another place where cultures of honor uh, arise, and that may be more salient to, to contemporary discussions. Uh, they tend to arise in urban inner city areas where police protection for minorities is not reliable. Well, that's what a culture of honor is. Uh, another fact about cultures of honor is they exhibit considerable cultural inertia. They persist once they're established for many generations, even when the situation giving rise to them, for example, the herding economy, uh, has long disappeared. <clears throat> 
right? Well, one of the really interesting parts of the Nisbet and Cohen book is they make a case that the American South is a venue where cultures of honor still, or a culture of honor still flourishes, particularly among a subset of white people in the American South. Here's the story. Parts of the American South were settled by Scotch-Irish herders. And in that, that's sort of what's now called Ulster, I guess. Uh, that, uh, that's an area where uh, <clears throat> there was a long tradition of cultures of honor. And you can see up there the maps of immigration into the American South. Well, what Nisbet and Cohen argue is that that culture of honor, which was imported uh, from Northern Ireland, uh, <clears throat> persists among white Southerners in the USA to this day, although, of course, there are no or next to no herders left. Sheep herding isn't a thing that goes, you know, the descendants of these people are used car dealers or journalists or dentists, uh, not sheep herders. And an exciting part, one of the reasons I like to talk about Nisbet's work, uh, is an exciting part of the story he has to tell is that it's so uh, aggressively multidisciplinary. He's been a real pioneer of finding evidence and data in lots of different places. Like what? Well, demographic data that indicates that among Southern whites, homicides are much more common in regions where herding was once common than in regions that never uh, had a herding economy. And also demographic data indicating that white males in the American South are much more likely than white males elsewhere in the United States to be involved in homicides resulting in arguments. But they aren't more likely to be involved in homicides that occur in the course of a robbery or other felony. So if you're a culture of honor, do if you're an American, a, a, a white male in the American South, uh, you're much more likely to kill somebody if you get into an argument. But you're not much more likely, you're in fact about equally likely to kill somebody if you're sticking up a 7-Eleven. Okay? Uh, and that's a noteworthy fact. There's also survey data indicating that Southerners, uh, again, um, in the uh, United States, are much more likely to believe things like violence is extremely justified in response to a variety of affronts. Just so I know who I'm talking to and how to react later, how many of you think violence is appropriate in reaction to affronts? No, well, if I... <laughs> If I said your mother slept with a pig, how many of you think, well, maybe you'd think I was joking. <clears throat> uh, how many of you are culture of honor? Oh, all right, now I can say some radical thing. <laughs> I, I always ask, you know, you want to be sure. Uh, or uh, uh, in this survey data, Southerners are more likely to believe that if a man fails to respond violently to an insult, he's not much of a man. How many of you disagree with that? I want to see if people just won't raise their hands. All right, how many of you haven't raised your hands yet? Uh, all right, we've got a few culture, either culture of honor or people who refuse to cooperate. All right, there's also legal scholarship that in uh, the southern states in the United States, citizens are given more freedom to use violence in defending themselves and their homes and their property. Uh, you may have heard of those so-called stand-your-ground laws in Florida and elsewhere, uh, which occur primarily in the South. But particularly compelling, I think, uh, were two studies. One, a field study of moral uh, responses to culture of honor violence, and a series of laboratory experiments. Uh, so these are two of the favorite uh, studies uh, that I know of in this area, my favorite studies, so let me tell you about them. In the field study, letters were sent to hundreds of employers in the north and south of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> the letters purported to, they were all phony, of course, uh, but they looked real. Uh, and they were sent to real employers, you know, Sears and uh, uh, Whole Foods and, uh, and uh, Costco and what have you, uh, and smaller employers. 
All the letters purported to be from a 27-year-old Michigan man. Nisbet uh, spent his career at the University of Michigan. These letters were mailed from Ann Arbor, uh, who had one blemish on his otherwise solid record. One letter explained the blemish this way. I've been convicted of manslaughter. That's a blemish. Uh, I got into a fight with someone who was having an affair with my fiance. He confronted me in front of my friends at a bar, told everyone that he and my fiance were sleeping together, laughed at me to my face, and asked me to step outside if I were man enough. I'm not going to ask how many of you would go outside. All right. Uh, the other letter, uh, so this is the non-culture of honor letter, explained that uh, the applicant had stolen a couple of expensive cars at a time when his family really needed money. Okay. Well, the Southern employers were much more likely to be sympathetic in response to the manslaughter case than the car case. But there was no such difference in the Northern employers. Let me just give you a feeling for the kind of difference. Here's an excerpt from one of the Southern employers writing back to this job, the person they thought was a job applicant. As for your problems in the past, anyone could probably have been in the situation you were. It was just an unfortunate incident that you should not be that should not be held against you. Just killed a guy in the parking lot. Uh, the, uh, I'm not culture of honor in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, your honesty shows that you are sincere. I wish you the best of luck for your future. You have a positive attitude uh, and a willingness to work and these qualities uh, are these are qualities that business employers are looking for. No uh, northern employers were comparably sympathetic. All right, so there's the field study. Now let me tell you about the laboratory experiment, and then we'll try to extract some lessons about moral realism. In the labor laboratory experiments were conducted uh, <clears throat> on white, uh, male, mostly upper middle class, University of Michigan undergraduates, some from the north and some from the south. The University of Michigan draws from a wide uh, demographic area. Here's the way the thing worked. Uh, so if you're a subject, they say, well, look, we're going to uh, get some saliva samples from you before and after you do a task. And this is wonderfully non-invasive, a Q-tip, you know, stick it in your mouth and stick it in the jar, we get the saliva sample. All right, uh, so uh, that's what they're told. Um, and then, uh, so we'll continue. Now, I say, all right, here's the, give me a saliva sample. Now, your first task, uh, you've got to go up to the other end of the room. And you walk down a long, narrow hall, and there's a confederate. And Nisbet chose the confederate very carefully. He was a trained actor and a football player. And he was a big dude. And this is important because uh, Nisbet was really worried that if he weren't such a big dude, you might deck him. So here's what happens. You're walking down the hall, okay? Uh, um, oh, yes, I have to. So you're walking down the hall to do the second part. And it's a narrow hall, and this guy's had a filing cabinet, and he sort of bumps into you, uh, right? And he says, sotto voce, but not so sotto, loud enough to be heard by everyone. He says, asshole. Okay, uh, and then you go down to the other end of uh, the hall and we get some more saliva samples. Uh, as I say, Nisbet wanted a really big guy there because he didn't want anybody to be tempted to deck him. Okay, uh, and how he ever got human subject approval for this, <laughs> I have no idea, but Dick's good at that. All right, here are the results. Okay, uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> Cortisol on the, I guess it's your left, uh, testosterone on the right. Uh, the blue lines are the non-culture of honor, the northern kids. Uh, those are basically statistically flat. Uh, the red lines, you get a spike in cortisol uh, and a spike in testosterone. Okay? Well, these findings at least suggest that moral attitudes about the appropriateness of violence in response to insults won't converge even under idealized circumstances, and that this, these disagreements are fundamental. To see why, we need to consider some of the, uh, what sometimes are called diffusing explanations. Explanations that moral realists offer to try to explain why these disagreements aren't fundamental. <clears throat> 
So the most obvious idea uh, is that, well, the Northerners and the Southerners are disagreeing about uh, violence in response uh, uh, to insult uh, because of a disagreement in non-factual moral beliefs. But it's very hard to see what those might be. The one obvious candidate is, everybody says, religion, right? But we know that's not the case because Nisbet tested for it and there were no systematic religious differences between the northern kids and the southern kids. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> Nor is there any reason, no, you might think maybe the northern kids don't know that being called an asshole is an insult. <laughs> Not a plausible hypothesis, right? Well, of course, it's possible that there's some unsuspected systematic difference of belief, uh, but I think it's clear that at this point there's a sort of burden of argument on uh, the person who says that this isn't a fundamental disagreement. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to say what that factual belief might be. Um, any that have been proposed uh, can be explored and tested for, and it doesn't seem to be the case. Well, maybe it's because one group or another fails to be impartial, uh, but as John Doris and his uh, collaborator uh, uh, said, look, that's very implausible. There's no reason to think that Southerners', Southerners economic interests are being served by being quick on the draw, while Northerners' economic interests are served by turning the other cheek. So that looks like an implausible one. And it's also very implausible to suggest that one group or the other is systematically more irrational. Okay? So, uh, study number one or body of research number one, it looks like the moral differences about is it morally acceptable to deck somebody who insults you or to you know, force it. I'm looking at you, I shouldn't be looking at you, I should be You don't do it to women, you do it to men, okay? Uh, so if he insults my wife, is it morally acceptable for me to beat the crap out of him if he refuses to apologize? Uh, looks like that may be a fundamental moral disagreement. All right, I said I was going to tell you about three research programs in this area. The second one I want to tell you about has become very famous, as John has, John Haidt. Uh, so many of you may know some of this work. Uh, but if you don't, uh, in some ways, it's the most memorable part of the talk. You'll see why. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, Haidt reports this uh, in many journal publications, but uh, in a very good read, uh, a book called The Righteous Mind. And I couldn't resist showing you I didn't do my homework in uh, Halifax. Uh, this is the American cover, okay? I was going to go to a bookstore in Halifax and see what the Canadian cover is. Why would I care? Same. Okay, here's the British cover. <laughs> All right. Well, um, in this book, uh, Haidt uh, reviews uh, work he did earlier on a number of high affect moral transgressions. Let me tell you about uh, three of these cases. The flag in the toilet bowl. People are given the following question. A woman is cleaning out her closet and she finds an old American or Brazilian flag. So uh, let me take a step back. I should have said this earlier. Haidt was looking for cross-cultural differences. So he did these in the United States and Brazil. So I'm going to give you data from the United States and Brazil. It turned out there aren't any cross-cultural differences but there are differences, they just aren't the ones that John was looking for. So here's what uh, participants were told. Woman's cleaning out her closet and she finds an old American flag, or in Brazil, of course, it's a Brazilian flag. Uh, she doesn't want the flag anymore, so she cuts it up into pieces and uses the rags to clean her bathroom. And then people are asked, should the woman be stopped or punished in any way? How many of you say yes? How many say no? Uh, okay, well, you folks ain't... Uh, all right, here are the data. Uh, not... Uh, well, what Haidt found, as I said, was uh, no significant Brazilian versus American differences. The differences were in socioeconomic status. Low socioeconomic status people said yes, or tended to say yes, they should be punished. High socioeconomic status people said uh, no, uh, it's not wrong in any way and shouldn't be punished. So there are the data. 
Here's a second one. Eating the family dog. Oh, family... It's not as bad as it sounds. Family dog was killed by a car in front of their house. A family's dog. Uh, they had heard that dog meat was delicious. So they cut up the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. Okay? Should the family be stopped or punished in any way? How many say no? How many say yes? Oh, we've got some mix. All right. Well, here are the data. Again, uh, high socioeconomic status people in Brazil and the United States uh, <clears throat> tend to say no. Low socioeconomic status people tend to say yes. By the way, I guess I should tell you because you may not know. So you might say, well, you sort of have some idea what socioeconomic status is, but what are you? Answer, if you're in this audience, almost certainly your high socioeconomic status, even if you're desperately trying to pay your tuition bills or what have you. Why? Well, uh, years of education is a major measure of socioeconomic status. Uh, people you find in university audiences typically are, uh, even if they're impoverished, uh, <clears throat> uh, their high socioeconomic status. All right, and the last one, uh, I see some people getting, uh, particularly the guy, younger guys in the audience, more interested in this one. Uh, if you have <laughs> sex before dinner, uh, well, it's not as interesting as you see, seem to think. Uh, uh, a man goes to a supermarket once a week and buys a dead chicken. But before cooking the chicken, he has sexual intercourse with it. There is a cartoon that John likes, uh, which appeared in Slate magazine 15 or so years ago. Question, should the man be stopped or punished in any way? Well, I'll ask you one word. How many think, yes, the man should be stopped or punished? How many think, no? <laughs> Turn around with that camera and take a picture of the people. <laughs> well, here are the data. Again, uh, <clears throat> high socioeconomic status people tend to say no. Uh, low socioeconomic status people tend to say yes. And just to nail it home that uh, people were really saying what you think they're saying, Haidt asked questions like this. Suppose you learn about uh, two different foreign countries. In one country, country A, people have sex with dead chickens very often. Kind of hard to take this seriously, right? But uh, in country B, they never have sex with dead chickens. Are both of these customs okay, or is one of them bad or wrong? And again, if you're high socioeconomic status, uh, you think they're both okay. You tend to think they're both okay. Uh, if you're low socioeconomic status, you tend to think one of them is wrong. Well, here again, it's very implausible that disagreements between these high and low socioeconomic status uh, subjects results from uh, <clears throat> factual disagreement, a failure of rationality or self-interest. So it's plausible that these disagreements are fundamental. All right. Now, I want to tell you about one more study. How am I doing on time? When do you want me to stop? When do we start? Oh, not a chance. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you about uh, some really cool work done by Mark Hauser uh, and Linda Barbanel. This research, uh, which may be the cleanest example uh, not as literally sexy, uh, but the cleanest example, uh, <clears throat> which focused on the so-called act versus omission distinction, uh, which philosophers and moral theorists have been concerned about for centuries, uh, and which has been extensively studied in moral psychology. Here's an example. So I'm going to give you an action case and an omission case. Right? A man is fishing in his boat. In the distance, he spots five men drowning. He can rush to save them. But in between the boat and the drowning men, he spots a swimmer. If the man rushes to save the five drowning men, the swimmer will be caught up in the boat's fishing net, and he will be killed. If he does nothing, the swimmer will be fine, uh, but the five men will die. Uh, the fisherman decides to rescue the five men. The swimmer is killed uh, <clears throat> in the fishing net. Okay, So he performs an action. He doesn't just sit there. He could just sit there. Uh, but he performs the action, saves the five. One guy dies. That's the action case. Okay, Here's the omission case. A man is in his fishing boat. In the distance, he spots five men drowning. He can rush to save them. Then he sees another drowning man between the boat and the five men. <clears throat> 
If the fisherman stops to save the one man, then the five men will die. If the fisherman rushes to save the five men, then the man closer to the boat will die. The fisherman decides to rescue the five men, uh, and the man who is closer to the boat dies. All right? Well, after each of these cases, people are asked what the fisherman did was from very bad to very good on a five-point scale. Uh, so let's see. Uh, in this case, uh, right? Uh, so this is the omission case. How many of you would say very bad? Bad. Good. Very good. All right, well, uh, we've got some non-cooperators, and we have ways of dealing with you. Uh, but, uh, pardon? Oh, sorry, neither good nor bad. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I, all right. Uh, well, there have been many studies of Western folks about this in the USA, in Europe, elsewhere. Uh, and Western folks tend to uh, judge uh, and indeed in many other cultures, also uh, uh, some studies in Asia, uh, uh, people in developed cultures tend to uh, judge the action cases much worse than the omissions case. Indeed, that gives you uh, a quick and dirty summary of the kinds of findings you find in uh, Western and advanced cultures. But what uh, Hauser and Abarbanel did is in a very elegantly designed study in uh, rural Tzetzel Maya speaking communities in Chiapas, Mexico, uh, they found that those people, uh, in contrast with city dwellers, uh, and indeed in contrast with town dwelling Tzetzel Mayas, don't judge the action case to be worse than the omissions case. These are the kinds of data they found from the Tetzel Maya. Dramatic differences between the Tetzel Maya case uh, and uh, what we found in uh, Western European and American audiences. Well, again, it's very hard to find, uh, to, to see how that difference could be explained by a factual disagreement or by irrationality or by self-interest. Uh, Rather, it looks like there is, on these kinds of cases, a fundamental moral disagreement between Westerners and Tzetzel Mayas. Conclusion. And remember, what I said was, what I wanted to illustrate for you is the way in which we've undergone a revolution and empirical data of a substantive sort is now contributing to philosophical debate. Uh, <clears throat> debates that have existed for a long time. Conclusion that I want to suggest is that some moral disagreements do indeed appear to be fundamental. Uh, and then we have to go on to ask exactly uh, what the philosophical implications are. All right. So I'm going to do three topics. To, you'll be happy to hear the next two. Uh, they get shorter with each uh, topic. I want to talk to you a little bit about altruism because in many ways I think this is the this work that I'm going to describe for you, this psychological work which bears on the venerable philosophical question uh, is the single greatest success in this area. So uh, as many of you know, uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, thought that altruism doesn't exist. According to Hobbes, people are egoistic. Uh, right? Uh, that yes, people help one another, but they only do it because they are expecting something in return. Okay? Uh, so that's why I guess I just said that. Uh, and uh, Hobbes goes on to say in that quote I flashed at you uh, elsewhere, uh, if they uh, didn't believe that they'd get something else in return, bad things would happen because uh, uh, benevolence and mutual help would come to an end. Now, other philosophers have taken a much less pessimistic view of human motivation. Everybody grants that people are sometimes motivated by self-interest. Nobody did, would deny that. Uh, but they insist that people sometimes act altruistically. That is to say, sometimes people are motivated only by a desire to promote the well-being of someone else. And surprisingly, one of the people who advocated this view uh, uh, was Adam Smith, who's better known as uh, one of the founders of modern economic theory. 
Well, one question to ask is why should philosophers care who's right in this debate between egoism and altruism? It's a debate between whether humans can be altruistic or whether we are egoistic through and through. Why should philosophers care? Well, some philosophers think that altruism is central or even necessary uh, with morality. So here's Jim Rachel's very well-known philosopher who said, moral behavior is at its most general level altruistic behavior. That's what moral behavior is. And because it's so cool, I want to spend a minute telling you about the way in which worries about egoism can distort philosophical debates. Uh, so some of the concerns about uh, egoism and altruism were high on the agenda of the great utilitarian thinkers. And these people were not only major philosophical thinkers, but great social reformers as well. Uh, both of them, uh, Bentham uh, battling against slavery and for penal reform, John Stuart Mill for women's rights and many other issues. But both Bentham and Mill, like most philosophers of their time, were egoists. They thought only egoistic motivation is possible for humans. But they're also utilitarians. And you know roughly what a utilitarian is. Utilitarian says you should do the thing that produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, but wait a minute. They've got a problem, right? Because utilitarianism says you should do what produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people. But egoism says you can only do what you think is for the greatest good for numero uno, for yourself. So they've got a problem what to do with this. Well, this led these great utilitarian thinkers in passages we never teach our students, right, uh, to uh, suggest some draconian measures. Uh, so Mill at one point says, in effect, what we should do is, Mill is an atheist. We should deceive people into thinking God will punish them if they don't help other people, right? So we should deceive them uh, into thinking the ruler of the universe will get on their case. Uh, why? Well, because that will make them at least act like utilitarians uh, and overcome their egoism. Well, it's not really overcoming their egoism, right? It's Hey, why are you doing this for these other people? Because if you don't, the dude in the sky is going to get you. Know, uh, you won't get your pie in the sky when you die. All right. Well, over the last 400 years, philosophers have debated the altruism versus egoism issue uh, <clears throat> using traditional philosophical methods, argument, anecdote, intuition, historical analysis. But I submit basically no progress was made. And then about 40 years ago, a bunch of psychologists, most notably Dan Batson, turned their, turned their attention to this debate. Here are two of Dan's books, uh, one from 30 years ago and one quite recent, uh, where he summarizes the debate. Um, and I think that Batson and his colleagues have made more progress in the last four decades than philosophers have made in the last 400 years. Indeed, what I want to urge for you, although I can't develop the complete case tonight, uh, is that Batson and his colleagues have resolved this century-old debate. Batson and his colleagues have shown that, contrary to what Thomas Hobbes thought, humans are indeed sometimes genuinely altruistic. Well, as I said, I can't do uh, uh, justice to 40 years of research in a few minutes. But since I think the stuff is so important uh, and has made such a fundamental contribution, I want to give you a flavor of the sort of thing that Batson and his colleagues have been doing. This is the way in which psychology and philosophy have merged to the benefit of both. All right, so Batson begins with a hypothesis that has a long history in philosophy. The hypothesis is that Genuine altruistic behavior can be evoked by empathy, uh, which Batson characterizes as an other-oriented emotional reaction to seeing someone suffer. Let me stress, he doesn't say this is the only way to evoke altruism. It's an open question whether it can be evoked in other ways. Uh, 
But this entropy, the empathy altruism hypothesis is the one he decided to test and has a long historical uh, tradition behind it. Empathy includes feelings of sympathetic compassion, at warm, soft-hearted, and tender, tenderness and the like. Well, the first step in this research program that's been going on for 40 years was to set up situations where some experimental subjects feel empathy for a stranger and others don't. Well, that turns out to be easy since there are well-known strategies for evoking empathy. Okay, subjects are then giving the opportunity to help the stranger. And sure enough, those who feel empathy are more likely to help. Well, that sounds cool, but it's important to see uh, uh, that showing that empathy evokes helping behavior isn't enough to show that empathy evokes altruism. So focus on this really carefully. This was Batson's work, uh, you know, insight of great importance. Why? Well, because uh, there might be some other selfish, egoistic motivation uh, that leads empathy to produce helping behavior. One possibility is that feeling empathy is itself unpleasant, or at least feeling empathy uh, evoked by a suffering person is itself unpleasant. So you're helping the uh, person, you know, suffering person. Why? Well, because seeing them suffer bothers you, and if you can alleviate the suffering, your annoyance will disappear. That's a plausible, a possible hypothesis, and it's actually a very old idea. Thomas Hobbes, uh, back in the 1600s, uh, described by Aubrey in uh, this Brief Lives, autobiographies of famous people of the time, he describes a case where Hobbes. Uh, he was walking with Hobbes, and Hobbes gave alms to a beggar. And he said, Hobbes, why do you do this? You're, 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 you're an egoist. And Hobbes' response was, uh, well, uh, I'm not only giving, uh, not only uh, relieves the man's distress, but it relieves his own distress in seeing the beggar's distress. All right. Well, if that's the correct explanation of helping behavior, then people feeling empathy should be less inclined to help if they could easily just leave uh, and uh, then not be troubled by their unpleasant empathic feelings. But if leaving is difficult or impossible, uh, then people experience empathy should be more inclined to help. So now we have, a we have two hypotheses that make uh, predictions. Here's the prediction uh, if empathy if people help when they're provoked by empathy because empathy is unpleasant, right? Here's the prediction if they're uh, genuinely altruistic. What's the difference? Well, the difference is here, right? Uh, so uh, if empathy is just unpleasant, uh, then when it's easy to escape, you shouldn't see much helping behavior. You should just skedaddle, right? Whereas, uh, <clears throat> Uh, over here, uh, if leaving is easy, but you're feeling genuine altruism, your helping behavior should be high, even if it's easy to escape. So that's the general idea that Batson suggested. And there are some data. Notice uh, that in this particular experiment, uh, the genuine altruism hypothesis is the one that's confirmed. And that pattern was repeated in numerous experiments where they vary the situation, the way the empathy is evoked, the means of escape, and so on. So I think we can conclude that the hypothesis that empathy leads to helping behavior because empathy is unpleasant is false. Right? So that hypothesis is ruled out. Now, of course, uh, this isn't the only egoistic alternative to Batson's empathy altruism hypothesis. But over the decades, he and his colleagues have ruled out one after another alternative. So psychologists by now have, I submit, done what philosophers were incapable of doing on this crucial issue for 400 years, or maybe if you want to trace the debate back to Plato and Aristotle uh, for 2,400 years. Uh, they've shown that Hobbes was wrong and Adam Smith was right. All right, last, and, and I only have maybe 15 or so slides, so you know, three or four minutes. Uh, 
Uh, I want to tell you about innate moral rules. Uh, so I'm only going to give you, since I knew time would be short, uh, a brief sketch to motivate you to explore some of this stuff on its own. I want to start with two of the giants of contemporary thought. One is Noam Chomsky, uh, who laid the foundations for modern cognitive science and argued that our judgments about the grammatical properties of sentences are produced by a complex system of mentally represented rules, some of which are innate and shared by all humans. This, so this gives us a, a picture somewhat like this of the psychological mechanisms underlying our linguistic judgments. Okay? So mentally represented grammatical rules interacting with a bunch of other stuff, producing intuitions or judgments about the sentences. The other giant I want to point to is John Rawls, uh, one of the great political uh, <clears throat> and moral philosophers of the 20th and 21st century. In a very short passage in his uh, monumental work, The Theory of Justice, Rawls noted a similarity between the project of seeking a set of principles that will entail our moral judgments and doing what Chomsky did, seeking a set of rules or principles that will uh, capture the judgments of a native speaker about the grammaticality of sentences in his language. And that gave rise to what has become known as the linguistic analogy, which has played a very fundamental role in contemporary moral psychology. If the analogy is a good one, we should expect the psychological mechanism underlying moral judgment to look something like this. Uh, instead of the linguistic grammar, uh, a set of moral rules, which some people call a moral grammar. All right? Well, cool, you say, but is the analogy a good one? Well, in some of the most exciting and important and deep work, I think, uh, that's been done in this area, uh, John McHale, uh, who's an extraordinary guy. John is a philosopher, has a PhD in philosophy from Cornell. Uh, he was a cognitive scientist. He did uh, a number of years postdocing at Harvard and MIT in cognitive science labs. And just in case you wonder what he does with his spare time, He's a lawyer. In fact, he earns his keep being professor of law at Georgetown University. So, uh, but uh, John has been arguing uh, for a, a few decades now, and in his recently published book, that the answer is yes. Based on an extensive body of cross-cultural experimental work and an extensive survey of legal systems around the world, Mikhail argues that a substantial core of the moral grammar, and remember that, if you don't like the grammar word, throw it out, it's just the internally represented moral rules that we use to form moral judgments. A substantial core of the moral grammar is culturally universal and probably innate. So that's the picture he's offering us. But it goes on from there because Mikhail then builds on Rawls's famous account of how you go about justifying moral principles. The philosophers in the audience will know it as the reflective equilibrium account. And he argues that principles in this innate core are justified for all human beings. But now, since these principles are discoverable using the methods of psychology, we have the astounding conclusion that psychology can enable us to discover universally justified moral principles. And there should be a slide here that says, but wait, there's more. Uh, because in a final step of just striking intellectual bravado, Mikhail, who as I said is a lawyer, argues that these principles can be used to provide a much needed philosophical foundation for claims about universal human rights. After all, they're justified principles, they're shared pan-culturally, they're innate. Uh, so they can be used to justify the doctrine of universal human rights that was first promulgated uh, by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, at the end of the Second World War. All right, so I asked you, can psychologists, when I started, can psychologists tell us anything about morality? Uh, what I want to conclude is, at this point, <clears throat> 
Those who think the answer is no, look like that. So now Dr. Stitch will uh, take some questions from the audience, and uh, there is a mic. Is the mic going to be up there? And you can line up by the mic and uh, ask your question of Dr. Stitch. Try to be aware that other people may want to ask questions too, so don't go on too long. And there may be some questions that come from uh, the audience listening online as well, so that might be a good Hi, uh, very good, uh, a very, very good presentation and well, well delivered. In the context of innate moral principles, mm -hmm. what crossed my mind is the nationalism wave in the world and more specifically in the United States that is coming from the top of the leadership. Should that bother us? Oh, that's a very easy question. The answer is yes. Uh, and it should bother me a lot more than it bothers you because in two days, I got to go back home. But <laughs> a crucial issue here is whether that phenomenon derives from innate or pan-cultural moral principles or not. And on the view that Mikhail has been developing and defending empirically, it doesn't. Uh, that the principles he's been focusing on are principles dealing with basically what lawyers call battery. That is to say, uh, harmful touching of another person. Uh, so what he's arguing is that there is this pan-cultural set of moral rules uh, about harming other people. Uh, and, of course, what would he say about the fact that um, there are people committed to unfortunate, to put it mildly, nationalistic views, uh, not only in the United States but elsewhere, and other people who oppose them. Uh, Mikhail uh, would say it's not clear whether either side derives from innate principles, but notice it could perfectly well be that one side or the other does, and that the other side is in fact not reflecting their moral principles in their actual judgments, just like, uh, and this is the exciting part, and I wish I had another uh, hour to go on about the um, uh, linguistic analogy and Mikhail's work, but as Chomsky pointed out decades ago, a half century ago, sometimes we make firm judgments about our language which don't reflect our underlying grammar. And my favorite example that I offer, I've been offering to students for decades, took me a long time to memorize how to pronounce this so it didn't sound weird. Here's a sentence in English, or maybe it isn't. Those of you who are native English speakers, is this a sentence in your dialect of English? What, what, what he wanted cost would buy in Germany was amazing. Good sentence in English or not? How many say good? How many say not? Well, you're all wrong. Okay, uh, that's in your moral ground. Here's another one. The rat, the cat, the dog chased, killed, ate the cheese. Huh? That's a sentence in your dialect of English, too. Uh, but the fact that it strikes you as obviously a bad sentence in English is what linguists call a performance error. So, no, long answer, <laughs> it might well be uh, that people on one side or the other of that debate uh, <clears throat> are in fact not reflecting their innate moral principles. It might be a performance error. <laughs> 
thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I was with you all the way until you started to talk about Chomsky. Um, those who know me will know why. <laughs> Um, I think um, the analogy between linguistic innateism, which I think is a big sham, really, and uh, innate morality is hugely problematic. But I have a question for you. Um, it would seem if you really have innate principles, then fundamental moral change in an individual would be very difficult. It would be kind of similarly difficult to learning a second language later in life. Um, however, those of us who had, like me, the misfortune to grow up in a country like East Germany and were halfway through their life forced to adapt to completely different moral standards, most of us actually manage just fine. And so it would seem that um, the change to really fundamentally different moral um, convictions um, is a pretty strong counterexample to this innate, to the strong innateism. Now, obviously, I, not, I understand that Mikhail's work is not as strongly innatist as Chomsky's linguistics mm -hmm. is, and Chomsky's linguistics right now isn't as strong anymore yes, as it used. Repeat the last sentence, I just didn't hear. Uh, Chomsky's linguistics right now is also not as strong anymore as it used to be like 30, 40 years ago. Um, so there's a lot less that is actually supposed to be innate uh, mm -hmm. that is left over. So I just want to know from you how strong you believe the innateism is, mm -hmm. if there's any. Okay, uh, well, um, first of all, excellent question. And uh, secondly, uh, let me say something that I, I think if I say three or four more times this term to my graduate students, uh, they will kill me. But I say it all the time. The devil's in the details. Uh, right. Um, so uh, I agree with you that the phenomenon of moral change poses a problem to strong moral innateism, moral nativism, as it's sometimes called. OK. Uh, so yes, it's a challenge. Uh, but the challenge is at least potentially meetable. Why? Uh, well, uh, one question is, um, where, are, where is the second morality, like the second language, where is the second morality working in the mind or in the brain? Okay. Uh, and one possibility is that in addition to the core innate morality, we have other systems that override it. Okay? Now, uh, so that's one, one theoretical possibility. Uh, but then uh, you give me a, one of my favorite empirical questions, and uh, I you know, have a little bit of work underway trying to explore these questions. Uh, but you focused on it with laser accuracy. So you said, uh, well, learning a new language is hard. And one thing you didn't say is that Many people who do it, do it imperfectly. But you illustrated it because you have an accent, OK? Uh, well, how about learning in English? Uh, your English is a lot better than my German, I assure you of that. Uh, how about uh, a second morality, right? Uh, so one question that needs to be explored much more carefully than it has been explored is what happens to the zeros and first and maybe second generation of immigrants from very different cultures. Okay? Uh, to a certain extent, they adapt their behavior. No question about that. Because if you did certain kinds of things that you did in the old country, in the new country, you'd get arrested or smushed. Okay? Uh, so behavior adjusts. But do people genuinely incorporate the same moral system and principles as the prevailing culture in their new home? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, we haven't studied the moral psychology of immigration well enough. I'd love to know the answer. And of course, if the answer is, uh, yeah, you don't learn it with an accent the way you learn English, uh, 
then that's much more problematic for the nativist view than if the answer is, yes, you learn it, but you learn it with an accent. We'll now take a question from uh, our online uh, viewers. Do you see limitations to the use of brain sciences in studying morality? Do I seek them? Do you, no, do you see any, any limitations to the use of brain sciences in studying morality? Oh boy, that's a, a very hard question because it's so open-ended. Uh, in many ways, currently, there are endlessly many limitations. Uh, I have um, some of my best friends are brain scientists. Josh Green, who was the pioneer in doing fMRI studies of people making moral judgments. Uh, uh, and by the way, let me let me fess up. Uh, right. When Josh was a graduate student, he came to me and said, I'm doing these new studies and showed me the first data. And I said to him, I advised against doing this. It's not going to go anywhere. Okay. Uh, Josh is now world famous uh, and a full professor of psychology at Harvard, although he has his PhD in philosophy. So never take my advice. But uh, <laughs> getting back to the, the question, uh, current methods in brain science are improving dramatically, but still terribly ham-handed uh, and crude, uh, right? So uh, under current circumstances, there are all kinds of limitations, things we can't ask accurately uh, because we don't have the technology. Now, if the questioner is asking, well, but in the future, uh, will there be limits nonetheless? And that's the kind of question that I never uh, try to answer because not to put it, uh, you know, not to beat around the bush, uh, I think it's a sucker's game to try to predict what science will do. Uh, <clears throat> nobody can do that with any great accuracy. It depends on how the neurosciences develop and evolve. Plenty of limitations. Now, will there still be uh, huge limitations 100 or 200 years from now. Well, first of all, we should be lucky if we're still human, if there are still human beings on the planet. I mean, look south of the border. Uh, but putting that off to the side, uh, I have no idea. Um, I have a question about uh, the question of fundamental disagreement. And yeah. I hope this is not just a linguistic quibble. But when you talked about fun dis uh, fundamental disagreement, you, you ruled out three things that would count as disagreement, uh, disagreeing over non-moral facts, failures of rationality, and uh, self-interest. Yeah. And then you gave the example of uh, the uh, um, uh, culture of honor and talked yeah. about northern and southern American uh, differences. But someone looking at that might respond and say, well, surely uh, white male identical twins where one was raised in the south and one was raised by family in the north would grow up to have either a culture of honor or not, depending on where they were raised. And so it's not really a fundamental difference between these two people. It's just a, 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 a byproduct where they happen to be raised. Um, so why doesn't that get accepted? excluded from something being good. counted as a fundamental difference. Good. Um, good. What do you mean by fundamental that doesn't go quite that far? No, uh, good. Thank you for asking the question. I should have jumped up and down more about uh, the answer. Uh, and the answer is, uh, in this discussion, in my work, but also in the work of others who have interacted with me and my colleagues, fundamental is a technical term. Okay, uh, it doesn't mean unimportant or superficial or not superficial or anything of the sort. It just is a, a, a piece of, of jargon to try to pick out those things that wouldn't change under ideal circumstances. Uh, and then, of course, we need a list of ideal circumstances. So the structure of what I said is, here's one possible list of ideal circumstances. Uh, no factual disagreement, uh, no irrationality, uh, uh, and no personal interest affecting the case. Okay? So let that be, by definition, or by stipulation, ideal circumstances, right, then fundamental moral disagreement is moral disagreement that would survive even under ideal circumstances. Now come back to your identical twins, okay? One's raised in the north, one's raised in the south. Uh, it's a fundamental moral disagreement if they don't have any 
factual disagreement. Uh, neither one of them is significantly more irrational than the other, and personal interest isn't involved. That's all that's being claimed. Not that uh, fundamental, you're certainly right, fundamental isn't the greatest word here, uh, but it sounds like you know, somehow it's uh, deep and, and maybe innate or something. None of that is intended. Okay? It's purely a technical term, and I should have marked it uh, next time. Oh, so next time I'll have 134 slides. Uh, but I'll, have a, I'll have a slide that says, this is a technical term. Okay? I had a question about the um, experiment where they were testing whether altruism was yeah. actually egotistical behavior. So you had a st stranger suffering in some way, like, I don't know, a baby abandoned on the street, and you were presented with the opportunity to help, but if you were given an easy escape route, maybe yep. you wouldn't be so inclined to help because you wouldn't feel bad, right? right? If you could just escape and not look at it. But I wasn't convinced of the soundness of that way of proving things because we have such powerful memories. So I feel like if I'm making the choice of whether to stay or go, I think if I go, I'm still going to feel really shitty because I'm going to think about how I didn't help that baby who was left on the street. Does that That's make sense? That's an absolutely terrific question. Uh, and the reason, I mean, first of all, objectively it's an absolutely terrific question. And one of the reasons I think it's an absolutely terrific question, other than that it is, is for years I made that objection to Dan Batson. Right? <laughs> And he took it seriously and did another series of experiments showing that that wasn't what was going on. Uh, so if you look at uh, the encyclopedia of philosophy, moral psychology, empirical approaches, things that John Doris and I did 15 years ago, uh, or uh, you know, another big long thing that we published, we say, here's what's, you know, Batson's made real progress. But your problem is a real problem for Batson, and he hasn't, therefore, nailed it down. And if you read the most recent edition that I think was just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, we say, that's not been nailed down. Here's how the experiments work. So uh, extremely acute uh, question, uh, um, and that's the answer, right? Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. I had a question about fundamental disagreement as well. I don't think it's the same as the one that was asked earlier, so we'll see. I thought that the, the, the kind of uh, position that you give and the, 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 that is given by the, the psychologist that you canvass to these cases of fundamental disagreement is might be a result of some distortion that comes about by, as a result of the, the kinds of options that are given to the people in the, to the subjects in the experimental or survey scenarios, right? So the aim is to eliminate uh, irrationality or non-moral disagreement, or sorry, disagreement over non-moral facts or uh, motivated reasoning or yes. something like this. <clears throat> and so what we do is we, we say in the case of the culture of honor, situation, right? We ask, uh, you know, do you think it's right to commit violence or not? Uh, and then we say, okay, well, this group says yes, and this group says no. And we say, well, we can't figure, come up with any particular fact or form of irrationality that would explain that immediately. But it seems to me that in order to eliminate the, uh, eliminate the possibility that there's one of the, the, the uh, non-fundamental forms of disagreement at play here is you have to go much more, much more deep than just those two options, right? You have to find out, well, what kind of picture of human flourishing or of human value or of a good human life is underlying for each group their response to the question. And then we have to see, well, okay, so is there any non-fundamental disagreement underlying their, these differing pictures, right? So it just seems to me that it moves m much too quickly from these responses to, to kind of uh, crude, not in the pejorative sense, I just mean not fine-grained options, moving too quickly from that to the conclusion that this is fundamental disagreement. No, good. Uh, again, uh, that, that, that's an excellent question, and um, I haven't addressed it, but uh, one of the um, moves that is often made in this literature, indeed in, I, I showed you the argument from Nicholas Sturgeon, uh, where he says, no, this is 
One of the arguments for moral nihilism that I, who he's not himself a moral nihilist, takes seriously, uh, but he goes on to list a number of other um, non-idealizing conditions or a number of other uh, what Doris and Placius called diffusing explanations. One of them very close to the one you're suggesting. Uh, so he says, well, social ideology, uh, right? And that is close to, you know, pictures of flourishing and what have you. Uh, and that's certainly right, uh, that if that's added to the list, that certainly hasn't been excluded from these studies, uh, right? So a couple of things, first of all, concessively. What I wanted to do, uh, so first I give and then I'll take back. What I wanted to do uh, in the talk is to convince you that this work has made real progress on the issue in a way in which a great deal of philosophical speculation has not made any serious progress in a long time. Okay, so we're finally coming together. Now, what about the social ideology issue? Um, well, in fact, uh, when John Doris and I started, uh, uh, we published a number of papers uh, arguing that the empirical literature supports fundamental moral disagreement, looking at a short list of idealizing circumstances, we then thought, all right, it's time to expand the list, right? And so we got out our sturgeon and reread that, and other people, David Brink and others, and many people have given lists. And we quickly decided that's a sucker's game. We can't make any progress. Why? Well, at that point, the person who is urging a richer notion of idealization, right? That's what's going on, a richer notion of idealized circumstances, has got to tell us a lot more about what these things are. So in particular with regard to social ideology, um, which ones count as social ideologies? Uh, okay, uh, uh, and are they all bad? You know, if, they're, if you and I differ on any pair, uh, are we then not uh, in, under idealized circumstances? So presumably uh, Sturgeon would say, uh, well, maybe Maoism and Nazism uh, their social ideologies which are diffusing explanations. How about liberal democracy or Confucianism or feminism? Do they count? Uh, right? And uh, so what we have now, I think, is a progressive dialectic where the psychology gets us so far and then highlights what the philosophers have to do next which is to say more about what counts as an ideal circumstance, or another way of saying the same thing, more about what counts as a diffusing explanation, and then we go back and look again. But that's the way you get progress here, uh, not uh, by uh, <clears throat> relying on your intuition or uh, a priori argument or transcendental argument, uh, things that philosophers have failed to make progress with for 400 years. Thank you. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. It's your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so you have to I hope. Um, but there will be time after uh, at the reception for perhaps asking more questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, my boyfriend asked a very similar question to the one I was going to ask, so I'm going to ask one instead about um, how you, if you have any recommendations about how to proceed uh, without committing an is-ought fallacy when we move from psychology to morality. Um, because one of the things that I notice in medicine, which is my field, is that we learn a whole bunch of things about the brain and we learn, oh, the brain does this, the brain does that. So we ought to be meditating, for example. We ought to be, uh, Did you, you know, say meditating or medicating? <laughs> both, <laughs> both. Um, so we ought to do, we ought to do these things. And to me, the, the, 
the ought, the, the jump from the is to the ought isn't always clear. And that's one of my concerns, I think, when, when I listen to talks about what psychology can tell us about morality. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, there's a long tradition about the notorious jump from is to ought or the is ought barrier. And uh, I think that that needs to be seriously rethought. Uh, why? Well, there are many different ways and reasons I could give you, but let me focus on one that emerges from the stuff I at least talked briefly about this evening. Suppose something in the vicinity of what John McKyle is urging is true. Okay? So suppose there is at least an innate core of moral principles that all normal human beings share, okay, pan-culturally. So that's one assumption. Now, take one other assumption, uh, which is that something in the vicinity, doesn't have to be the exact story, but something in the vicinity of the account of the justification of moral principles that's offered an enormously influential justification of moral principles offered by John Rawls in the Theory of Justice and many other publications. Well, suppose something in that vicinity is right, okay? If you make those two assumptions, then, as I said in the talk, you get the startling consequence that cognitive science has important moral implications. It can tell us what, not all of them perhaps, but it can tell us of certain moral principles that they're justified. Okay? And then I bounce the question back to the person who's been obsessing about the is ought distinction since David Hume or earlier and say, uh, so where's the barrier here? Now, to be sure, McConnell may be wrong about the brain. And to be sure, Rawls may be wrong about uh, how you justify moral principles, but he certainly has convinced lots and lots of philosophers, okay? Uh, well, if anything like McKyle's view is right and anything like Rawls's view is right, there's just no problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, in a sense, what I'm saying is uh, the person who thinks there is a problem has got to go back to the drawing board and tell me what the problem is. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, that uh, concludes the, uh, the talk. And as I said, there is a reception um, at the back. And I think that Mark thanked everybody that needed to be thanked. So uh, we can just uh, thank our speaker again uh, very heartily for a great.